we're talking about today are the building blocks of life, carbohydrates, fats, proteins, and if we have time, nucleic acids, although we've talked about nucleic acids at some length already. Do not write down everything on every slide. Do not write down everything on every slide. I'm going to highlight what I really want you to get out of this. Really, really want you to get out of this is the cool stuff. Like, oh, that's why that is the way it is. More than the great gory details of macromolecule structure. And I think you'll see what I mean as we go. Okay. So, not writing this down, but just understanding that within cells, small organic molecules make big molecules. And the key here is that what we're talking about in molecules of life is chains. We make chains. All right? Chains is the idea. We're going to talk about chains. Chains of amino acids make a protein. Chains of simple sugars make a carbohydrate. Chains of fatty acids and glycerol make a fat. Okay? So the idea here is to understand that it's chains made of covalently connected atoms. Strongest bond we know besides the nuclear forces, covalently connected atoms. How are they joined? Well, they're joined by something called dehydration, where we've talked about this before. Freshman biology, we talk about it. I think we mentioned it in this class, but I'm not sure. Where everything we're going to talk about is a chain. The word for a chain is a polymer. Polymers are made of monomers. Monomers are single things, like an amino acid. And to join a bunch of amino acids together, we take off a hydrogen from one and a hydroxyl group from the other, and water is produced. That to make a larger polymer, a longer polymer, we remove a water molecule. So to make this polymer right here, from each of these monomers, how many water molecules were removed? One, two, three. Not four. The fourth one is hanging out in the ends. See what I mean? Well, to put, okay, if I want to if I wanna, uh, put these two together, I have to take out one water. So it's N minus 1, number of monomers minus 1. It's just a tricky question. It's kind of dumb. They always seem to ask things like that. If I want to break it apart, and we're going to talk about this in a little bit, let's say you ate a carbohydrate and you digested it. This is the carbohydrate. To digest it, you've got to break the bonds. We've talked about breaking bonds before. Exergonic reactions, catabolic reactions, cutting reactions, breaking bonds. We do that by adding a water molecule back in. So now we're talking about the importance of water in any physiology, in anything living. All right. By the way, these are also pictures in your textbook, Chapter 5. So, what I'm showing you here is the first group, carbohydrates, is what we're going to talk about first. All right, and just the general overall structure of a carbohydrate is C, H, okay, C to the N, H to the 2N, O to the N. Is that okay, math people? Fun math people, those of you that are algebraically challenged. It means whatever numbers with the C, there's double that for the H and one for the O. Where do you think it got the name carbohydrate? Carbon, hydrate, water. CH2O. Okay, so you see, now this hexo sugars don't quite fit it, but generally sugars have the same 
kind of structure. And then if we go, in fact, this is ribose sugar from RNA. Sugars also come in linear forms and ring forms. And it's the ring form we're going to talk about because that's two very important, uh, three very important molecules in, physio in life are ring forms. This C six H twelve O six. Don't weigh me count. Good luck. I'm going. All right. So just some terms. Uh, if you see the term glycosidic linkage, you see glyco here. Prefix meaning sugar. This should tell you they're talking about carbohydrates. Saccharide means sugar. Talking about carbohydrates. Am I telling you anything you didn't really know? Sugars or carbohydrates? All right. Now to the what I think is the interesting stuff, and you might not. First of all, this is just showing how two sugar molecules are put together by removing atoms from the end of them to make water and the bond that is formed here is a covalent bond with this oxygen atom combining with that carbon atom what they're not showing on here at each corner is a carbon okay so they don't when they draw these structures except for this one for some reason and I don't know the organic chemistry enough to tell you why there these corners are the carbons all right so anyway what they're showing you here is that the oxygen, the waters are removed, the oxygen is bound to this carbon and that carbon forming a covalent bond. Strong bond. This is table sugar, sucrose. Questions? Good. A polysaccharide, many sugars, are polymers of sugars. This is what we call carbohydrates. So here's one, starch. Notice that starch is a chain of a whole bunch of sugar molecules all put together. I don't know how to write that or how you'd put that in your notes, but starch is a chain of sugar molecules. And they give them names. The names aren't that important. But plants store starch and use it for food. They break down. They pull apart these and use the glucose molecules to do cell respiration with. Yeah. We eat the tater that's filled with starch, break down the chain, Use the glucose molecules to make ATP. This one is a storage in animal cells. In our cells, we use glycogen. We store glycogen. Glycogen is chains of glucose. It's slightly different than starch. But this is showing in an animal cell pockets of glycogen. Why is it stored there? Why is it stored? That's right, so it can be used later. Your liver is really good at storing glycogen. That's what it does. It takes all the extra sugar out of your blood, packs it away as glycogen for later. If you have too much, converts it into fat. That was fat. That's what people are listening on, you know, somewhere in the world. There's another plant carbohydrate. It's called cellulose. Also known as fiber. It makes up plant cell walls. We cannot digest it. Humans cannot digest 
cellulose. Neither can most mammals. Some mammals, like cows, have a special stomach to help them digest it. They have bacteria in their stomach that help them digest the cellulose. Yes, sir. We can digest heat. We can digest starch. We can't digest cellulose. And the reason we can't digest cellulose is only because of the way it hooks together with the other, is only in the way these are hooked together. Starch links together. It says 1,4 linkage. What that means is that the oxygen, this bond is between the first carbon and the fourth carbon of alpha glucose monomers. In other words, an alpha glucose has the hydroxide, has the hydro hydroxyl group down here. A beta glucose has a hydroxyl group up here. Why are they like that? They're called isomers, if you ever had chemistry and you learned that term. So again, I think this is really interesting. So in starch, it's only the alpha glucoses that go together and they form this like straight chain in cellulose you see that it's you're flipping the hydroxyls and you're like so what so what we're going to talk about enzymes later but the enzyme we have to help us digest food we don't have one of those for that so when you eat your fiber it's going straight on through when you eat your celery and you're chewing up all that fibery stuff, which is the cell wall, you're just chopping it up into small pieces so it can go all the way through you and come out the other end. When we talk about digestive systems a little later, we'll come back to this. So talk about why herbivores can and you can't. In polymers with alpha glucose are helical, like like this. Polymers with beta glucose are straight. Now think about this. So in a plant, it can make a really strong upright structure because they stick together great. So these parallel fibers form cross links with each other. So a plant can stand up. Why can they? Because the hydrogen here bonds with the OH there in a hydrogen bond, just like in water. So they form these straight, and they end up being twisted around, but they form these very straight, tightly connected, whereas starch would never do that. Starch forms these things, and it's all over the place. So starch in a plant... It's like a root, it's like a potato, and it's just plotched in there. Cellulose in a plant is in fibers. Yeah or no? See, now I think that's cool. All right, moving on. Extra stomach, bacteria inside, help it digest cellulose. When we talk about digestive systems again, we'll come back to that. Uh, one other specialized form of carbohydrate is called chitin. I just wanted to throw this out there for you. Chitin is the thing that's in spider webs. Uh, chitin is in the exoskeleton of arthropods, so it's really hard. It's a very, very hard carbohydrate. It's another step of Bonding beyond, beyond cellulose. Spider silk is chitin. The cell walls of fungi are made of chitin. Not cellulose. Which is why they're not plants. Which we're going to see tomorrow. Alright, lipids. There's a lot of stuff on here. Alright, the one thing to really know about lipids is that it says they have little or no affinity for water, which means they don't mix with water. But we knew that, right? 
What's the word we use for that? Nonpolar. Why are they nonpolar? Because hydrocarbons form nonpolar covalent bonds. Just a review of the nonpolarity of fats. So generally, a fat is made of two parts, and you probably should know this, it's made of glycerol and fatty acids. They give it different names for fatty acids, but notice, the general formula for a fat, C a lot, H a lot, O, few, few. Look, this one is one, two, three C's. See, glycerol is a hydrocar is like carbohydrate. C three H looks like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, O three. But the whole carbohydrate is only one is only gonna be one, two, or actually one, two, three, four, five, six O's total with all those C's and H's. So if I go to the, there's a fat molecule, a triglyceride, tri, one, two, three, glyceride has three uh, fatty acids and one glycerol. You see all the C's and H's. Here's an interesting question. Why is there so much more energy in fat than in carbohydrates? Fat gives you 9 calories per gram. Carbohydrate gives you 4-ish calories per gram. Those are all the bonds. Look at them all. All packed in there. Cut them up. Lots of energy. There are two basic types of fat, and you should know why. There's saturated fat, which is also known as animal fat. Animal fat, solid, at room temp. Like this butter, like human fat, solid at room temp. Before I tell you why, we should probably look at plant oils, which are unsaturated fat. Plant oils are liquid at room temperature. They're liquid at room temperature, so your peanut oil olive oil, all liquid at room temperature. Animal fats not. Here's why. In animal fats, the triglyceride is all single bonds between the carbons. Forms this very nice flat molecule, and flat molecules stack. Closer two molecules are together, make a solid, right? In liquid water, the molecules are apart. In solid water, they're together in a matrix. However, plant oils, plant fats, have a double bond between two of the carbons. You can't see that. They have double bonds between two of the carbons, and so the molecule is bent. Which means when they're all floating around, they don't pack together. They can't pack together neatly because you get this kind of... You're like, well, why don't they just do this? Because they won't. It's random how they're in there. So if it's random how they're in there, you can't... They won't... It's not like something's stacking them up. They won't stack up. They'll be all separated from each other by things like this, and they'll be that way, and they'll be this way, and they'll be this way, and they'll be spread apart. When mo the farther molecules are apart, the more liquidy something is.
things. There's a reason why plant oils are liquid and animal fats are solid at room temperature. Now, if you heat an animal fat, it liquefies. Well, that's because you've broken bonds and unstacked them by getting them to move around faster. Is this making sense? Good. So other kinds of fats in a human are phospholipids. We talked about these before from the cell membrane. They have the phosphate group at the top and the fat group at the bottom. And the phosphate group is water-soluble because it's polar. And this part is non-water-soluble. So when you put them together into a cell membrane, water can't go through the cell membrane on its own, so you trap water out and water in. We talked about that before, but I just wanted to show you the reason. Another kind of fat in humans is called steroids. Just so you know, cholesterol is a steroid fat. Hormones are steroid fats. Estrogen and progesterone, specifically, are steroids. All right? And a steroid fat is a very different structure. Okay, so we've already talked about proteins a lot. Okay, so like writing all that down is not that important. We know that it's important for cell communication. We know that it's important for transporting stuff. We're going to talk about enzymes, a special kind of protein, next week. Here's a whole list of things that proteins do. Hormone transport, receptor proteins. We've already talked about this. Okay. Enzymes we're going to spend time on next week. So we'll come back to that. Or actually after your exam, two weeks. We're going to come back to this. We talked about the term polypeptide. And that in protein synthesis, you make a polypeptide of amino acids, right? And then a protein is one or more polypeptides. And now we're getting to why you have your pipe cleaner in your hand. First of all, a protein is made of an amino acid. A little detail about amino acids. All amino acids have an amino group on one end. There's the answer for the quiz, amino. And a carboxyl group on the other end. In the middle, always, is the alpha carbon, a carbon, four carbon. It's got four covalent bonds, a hydrogen, and the variable R group. The only difference between any of the 20 amino acids is this part here. Otherwise, they're all exactly the same. And then your book goes into this, and I have on here a giant list of all the amino acids and what they look like. R group, R group, R group. You see how it's different for each of them. That's why they're different. That's why I'm showing you. All right, so what about proteins? themselves. This you need to know. There are four structures to a protein and we're using the pipe cleaners for this. Primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary. Don't write everything on here, but you need to know there are four levels of protein structure. Primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary. The primary structure of an amino the primary structure of a protein primary structure of a protein is the chain of amino acids. So this is primary structure here. The straight up chain of amino acids just like your pipe cleaner. What happens to it after it's made is what makes it a protein. There are two possible secondary structures of a protein. We're going to make them with our pipe cleaner. The first kind is called an alpha helix. So take your pipe cleaner and twist it into a spiral, like around your finger or something. And twisting it around your finger, 
if you straighten out your pipe cleaner again and then fold it so it does this thing. Is a pleated sheet. It's called beta. The beta structure is a pleated sheet. So if you were to fold your pipe cleaner like that, you'd have a pleated sheet. Yes, beautiful. All right, tertiary structure. In the tertiary structure, you take the alpha helix slash beta pleated sheet and twist it all together. So I would take this one and I could make actually part of it an alpha helix, part of it a pleated sheet, and then I just crunch it all together. I just took the first form and then bent it together. So like here, you see alpha helix, pleated sheet, uh, pleated sheet, pleated sheet, pleated sheet, and then it's all bound up together. And it does that by forming what are called sulfur bridges. Proteins, yes, yeah, this thing called a disulfide bridge. This is figure 520 in your book. There's hydrogen bonds holding it together and sulfur bridges. And so it binds up like that. You're like, why? Well, because the shape of a protein determines what it does. So it has to have a specific shape. And you're like, well, this doesn't look like it has any shape. That's because you don't have anything for it to do. So what's that called? Tertiary structure. Primary is the pipe cleaner. Secondary is the twisting or folding. Tertiary is the whole thing plots together. And the last one is called quaternary. Quaternary, take your neighbor's pipe cleaner and plot it together with yours. Here you go. That is a quaternary structure. Not all proteins do this. Not all proteins do this. Okay? Hemoglobin is one like that. Hemoglobin is stuff in your blood. Okay. Notice collagen is the one that makes your skin stretchy. It's a bunch of alpha helices all stuck together. Weird. And alpha helix makes that nice little spring. Oh. And you bind a bunch of springs together and you got springy skin until you get old like me and it all stretches out. Or your grandpa when you pull up on the back of his hand and his skin stays tented up because all the collagen is not springing back anymore. All the springs are stretched out. Try it sometime just for fun. Grandpa, love you. But we're going to be able to alter proteins form called denaturing by messing up its shape. We're going to come back to that a little bit later. It's like when you heat your eggs and the, and the egg white goes from so, liquid to solid and stays solid. Weird. Why? It's a protein. Protein got deformed. Got deformed. And actually, instead of being like this and going to this, this would be a more liquid form. It'd go the other way. The liquid form, where it's all spread out, goes to a solid form, denatured. I just included this for fun.